You're watching Liquid Lunch on Biz TV. I'm Frank Morano. John has chosen to leave you, the loyal viewers of this program, and instead go do a drive-by celebration of his brother's birthday. So I guess we see where John's priorities are. I am choosing to remain here with you. Uh, one quick note, um, and then we'll get into some of the headlines that are making headlines today, um, is one of the, I, you know, I, I hate to say this because I know there are a lot of people really suffering right now, not just health-wise, uh, not just economically, but uh, mental health-wise, psychologically, and a number of other areas. But there have been so many aspects of this quarantine that I've really been enjoying, um, one of which is I'm getting a chance to catch up on a lot of great television programs and movies that I've been wanting to see and have never gotten to see. And that's been really interesting and really fun. Um, also, I've been a, a, having a chance to do a lot of reading. Uh, and that's one of my great regrets normally is that I don't get to read all the books that I'd like to. And I just want to tell you about one of the books that I'm reading now in case you're also looking for a good book to read. This is a book that's short. Uh, which I know many of you will appreciate. I certainly do. It's called Revolt of the Elites um, and the Betrayal of Democracies by Christopher Lash. Now, the author has passed away. It's about 25 years old, this book. But this book is so great. And now Christopher Lash and the the kind of the criticisms that he has of our education system, of our media system, of our political system, of our government. It's amazing that he wrote this 25 years ago because the things that he was criticizing 25 years ago are even more true now than ever. And he points out, now, I don't really consider myself a conservative uh, because when I can think of people who are conservatives, I think of people like George W. Bush, Mitt Romney, John McCain, uh, Stephen Moore, even including people that I like, because they embrace this um, free market ideology at all costs. And I always thought, wouldn't it be great if there was somebody, some thinker out there that points out the shortcomings of free market capitalism, no holds barred, but all, at the same time also talks about the importance of maintaining America's cultural traditions, and at the same time pointing out the fact that the folks that live in Manhattan and Malibu shouldn't be looking down at the rest of the country. And finally, I found it in this book, Revolts of the Elites by Christopher Lash. So if you're interested in a book to read that I think um, provides a great playbook and a great textbook for the populist agenda, whether you're left wing, right wing, or somewhere where you don't know what wing you're on, I do recommend that book. Now, a couple of items uh, in the news. As you might have seen, I know we have a lot of viewers of the show that are very Wall Street oriented, very Wall Street minded. Um, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell came out today and said that he thinks that the economic damage that's being done to the country right now might be permanent. So initially we were hearing about a V-shaped recovery, meaning that the economy would come back quickly. That's uh, becoming apparent that it probably won't be the case. Then we were hearing that it's going to be a slow and steady recovery. Now you hear Jerome Powell saying this could be permanent. And all the more reason that I think what Joy Villa said there and what we've had a number of other guests say on this program, not just today, but um, in the last week or so, that I really think it's so important to give people the option of going back to work. Now, um, I recognize that if there's a second wave of this disease, it could provide even more uh, economic you know, catastrophe. But if you look at what's happening now, I live in New York, New York City and New York State, which is the epicenter of this disease in terms of diagnostic cases and in terms of deaths. One quarter of all the people that have died in this disease, from this disease, maybe more, are people that are in nursing homes. And we can discuss the poor care that's being been given to people in nursing homes throughout this whole pandemic. But you're seeing alcohol abuse. Uh, you're seeing drug abuse. You're seeing domestic violence. You're seeing suicide all go through the roof. How much longer can we maintain this economic devastation. Uh, I really think, look, if you have a business or if you're an individual and you don't feel comfortable going back to work, you shouldn't, especially if you're part of an at-risk population. In fact, I would suggest that once we do reopen, the at-risk populations should be the, um, the last people that should be reintegrating as part of society. But I think to tell a private business owner 
who wants to take the risk, who wants to take proper safety precautions, that they can't open up their business, I think it's incredibly short-sighted. And now I realize in New York, we're going to start getting back to work this weekend in some parts of the state, but I really think we need to open it up a little bit more than that and give people the option of uh, of going back to work. Because what's happening now is just unsustainable. It's unsustainable for our economy. It's unsustainable for our mental health. And it's unsustainable for us as a society, uh, quite frankly. So uh, I really am hoping that we can figure out a way in across the country, not just in blue states or red states, to get back to work if people are comfortable pronto. Now, what they did in Texas when they reopened, uh, they reopened uh, salons and some other things. They said, you know, if you're a business and you're not comfortable reopening, don't reopen. And I I think that makes all the sense in the world. And why we seem to be so behind the eight ball in states like New York is just beyond me. Now, the other um, topic that John Burnett and David Eisenbach hit on a little bit was this House proposal from Nancy Pelosi for $3 trillion worth of stimulus. But does anybody ask where this money comes from? It's just magically created out of thin air. And it's so interesting to me that the one thing that both parties seem to be in agreement on in Washington is that they want to help out Wall Street. And look, I'm not helping out. I'm not against helping out Wall Street, but I'd much prefer to give individuals a little help first and help out Main Street before we uh, look to um, bail out companies like Goldman Sachs or before we bail out big corporate lobbyists. By the way, the uh, CEO of uh, Goldman Sachs just got a big, big raise. I think around the around the two hundred thirty percent range. Range. Don't don't quote me on that. But uh, it's good to see that uh, while people are suffering, thirty three million people out of work, the CEO of Goldman Sachs is getting a big raise. You know who else got a big raise? Andrew Cuomo signed himself a seventy five thousand dollar pay raise. Uh, does that make any sense to you? While New Yorkers are suffering and while tax revenues to this state are at an all time low, that the governor is signing, is raising his own pay by $75,000 makes no sense to me. We'll explore it tomorrow on Liquid Lunch. We've got some great guests. If you want to stay in touch with me, you can find me on Twitter at Frank Moreno. It's Frank, M O R A N O. In the meantime, we'll see you tomorrow. Same bad time, same bad channel. Thanks for watching Liquid Lunch.